It's inevitable that as an individual Bond actor's tenure goes on, their performance changes, evolves somewhat. The actor becomes more confident in the role, feels more empowered to make unconventional choices, and gets to immerse themselves in the character over a number of years, as well as the fact that their performance may well have to adapt to new writers, new directors, and new creative directions. I mean, see Moonraker into For Your Eyes Only as a major whiplash-inducing gear shift in tone that Roger had to contend with. Go backwards, forwards, quickly! Obviously, such a diversity of performance during a tenure can lead to fans like myself discussing and speculating on what individual film can be pointed to as an example of a Bond actor's peak performance as 007. General consensus, in my experience at least, tends to point to the third film of each actor's run as an example of a Bond actor at the peak of their powers. Goldfinger for Connery, The Spy Who Loved Me for more, The World Is Not Enough for Brosnan, and Skyfall for Craig. Sorry Dalton, you were just one MGM lawsuit away from having your own peak, but never mind. The third film does indeed seem to be the safest of bets. I mean, it's when an actor generally starts to seem at their most comfortable in the part, buoyed by the previous successes that has led them to that point, as well as being used to the routine of working with the often familiar-faced production team. Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. All that being said, there have been times in the last couple of years where I've finished watching a certain Bond film or two and I've come away from it thinking, like, oh gee, that could have been that actor's best performance ever as James Bond, and it wasn't their third film. Am I being deliberately contrarian, or am I having a stroke? So I thought it'd be fun to go through each of the Bonds in turn and cite what I think is their peak Bond performance. Obviously this is all very subjective and I welcome you to share your own opinions and even hurl abuse at mine in the comments section below. And just for a change of pace, let's go backwards through the chronology for a change, starting with Daniel Craig. In many ways I think Craig is the most difficult of the Bonds to single out just one performance as an example of him at his peak. He is very deliberately doing a somewhat different kind of performance in each of his films. Casino Royale is obviously him becoming Bond, picking up the pieces of what we know Bond to be as the film goes on. Quantum of Solace is him as a hardened, revenge fueled blunt instrument. Skyfall is him at, I would say, at his most Fleming Bond. The depression, the malaise, it all feels very later stages Fleming Bond to me, like the Bond from You and Live Twice, the novel, has been brought to screen. Spectre is him at his, uh, I would say, most cinematic Bond. The cool, the swagger, he's very much channeling typical Connery throughout much of that film. Then there's no time to Die, which is him at his most, uh, I don't know, really? <laughs> Bond at his most Daniel Craig? Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I like his performance in No Time to Die a lot, but I find it a difficult one to pigeonhole, as it's an entire tenure of performances in just one film. Yeah. But then it all went wrong, didn't it? I think Daniel Craig is a really fine actor, and I don't think he's given a bad performance as James Bond, but personally, I am going to rule out Quantum and No Time to Die from this list as examples of him at his peak. Quantum I find a little too one note, and No Time to Die I find a little bit too many notes. Uh, so that leaves us with three Craig films to choose from. Despite my sighting of both Skyfall and Spectre as the best examples of Craig as the typical Fleming Bond and the typical cinematic Bond, I'm actually going to plant my flag in Casino Royale as being Craig's peak performance as James Bond. It helps, of course, that the film gives him a real great range of emotions and scenarios to play in, but I think he really nails everything he's asked to do in that film especially. I mean, from the brutality of the Madagascar chase sequence, to the swagger of walking through the casino, to the love story, to the confrontation with the villains, I think that Craig's performance in Casino Royale is a truly beautiful thing in this series. I really don't think it's a case of him peaking too soon though, because like I say, I think his performances in Skyfall and Spectre are really top-notch as well, and depending on your taste, I can totally see someone citing either of those as him at his peak, but Casino Royale just has that added sense of magic that permeates the whole thing, and at the centre of it is Daniel Craig's wonderful performance as James Bond. In some ways, I find Brosnan's performances quite difficult to narrow down to. There is a wonderful consistency throughout his entire tenure. I mean, well, that being said, I think you can definitely see him growing more comfortable in the part as his films go along. I mean, he gets so comfortable in the part, he develops some kind of a tick where he ends almost half of his sentences with, eh? So, the girl who hates to be tied down, eh? The cool kid you eh? Same person who set me up in North Korea, eh? Put your back into it, eh? It makes a really great pairing with the famous Roger Moore starts every sentence with well by the end of his own tenure tick. Well, I'll, uh, 
Well, are you, uh, well, under the circumstances, sir, well, there was a heck of a crowd on the piece. If you're in the mood to get completely sozzled, I can't recommend the A View to a Kill well drinking game enough. Take a shot every time Roger says well, and, well, don't come to me when you need your liver transplant. The World's Not Enough is often cited as Brosnan's peak, and I have to admit, uh, I sure love that man in that film, and at one time or another I would have agreed that that is indeed his best work in the series, though that's not to overlook Goldeneye or Tomorrow Never Dies. I mean, the former is a really strong first turn as Bond, one that doesn't even feel like it is a first film for the actor. It feels like he was always Bond in that film, and Tomorrow Never Dies puts him in some great situations, and it's probably one of the performances that I'd cite as making you want to be James Bond. The stuff that he gets to do in that film, it all just seems so fun and so full of adventure. It's a real, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to be that guy kind of performance. However, I'm going to put myself out on a limb here. Let's talk Die Another Day. Have you gone mad? The perennially put-upon Bond film, mainstay of bottom rankings in many a poll, and yet I think it might well be Brosnan at his absolute peak as James Bond. I mean, strip away all the stuff that is perhaps quite rightly grumbled about, you know, invisible car, outrageous action, nonsense sci-fi. We're well, not science fiction, we're in fact science fact. Take all that away and you really have quite a dark story about Bond being incarcerated, disavowed by his own people, betrayed by people within his own organization, and I think Brosnan brilliantly conveys Bond's turmoil through appropriately subtle means. A scene that really stuck out to me on one of my recent rewatches was the one with he and M in the tube station, where she's keen to get him back on board. You burned me, and now you want my help. What did you expect, an apology? It's a very expositional scene for the most part, but it's something of a turning point, with Bond being recruited back to duty despite his boss being harsher than even some of the villains have been with him in the past. You're no use to anyone now. I think Brosnan is just so good in that scene, and I just love how Brosnan plays that whole arc throughout the entire film, his pain at enduring horrific torture only to be freed and then treated like a villain, to redeeming himself through his typically great detective work. He's very practical about it though, there's no kind of uh, open arms from M and nor is he expecting that. She's pretty clear that he's back on the service because he's useful again, but Bond knows that and he's kind of okay with it because I mean he is here to save the world after all and this is good as an apology as he's ever gonna get, so okay. Dine of the Day features a whole host of really wonderful Brosnan Bond moments. Let's ignore the ice tsunami and electrified pain faces and focus on the positives. Brosnan is just so damn comfortable in this part in this film. He gets to have a whole host of great Bond moments while also having some wonderful dramatic work to do. I mean, say what you will of the quality of the film itself, but I personally think it represents Pierce Brosnan at the peak of his Bondian powers. It feels kind of unfair to include Dalton in this same category given that he only got two goes at the part, but for posterity's sake, I'll make this quick and just say that for me, License to Kill is him at the peak of his Bondian powers. Uh, despite my own preference for License to Kill over The Living Daylights, I think that the general consensus is that his first film is actually his best, and hey, I think he does great work in it. I feel that the overall tone, though, of License to Kill fits to his strength as Bond better. They take away almost all of the Roger era hangover quips and situations and play to his strengths, to his cold brutality. I think Dalton is really terrific in License to Kill and he's so clearly more comfortable in the part in that film. I mean, it feels like there's a real clear direction for what his version of the character was gonna be and he really excels at it in that film, I think. And now, conversely, we have a Bond who had a heck of a lot of attempts at achieving peak 007. Roger Moore! True to the third film rule, The Spy Who Loved Me is often touted as his best Bond performance as well as just his best Bond film overall and indeed, I love the film and I love Roger Moore in it. His first two goes at Bond suffer from a slight stiffness, shall we say, a part of the problem being that in places he was written and directed to be a much harsher character than Roger was keen or comfortable playing, and it just comes across a bit awkward in places as a result. In Spy, he really hits his stride, and from that point on, he is the Roger Bond we all know and love. There is a wonderful consistency throughout all of his performances from that point on. I can definitely get behind Spy being him at his peak Bond, but there are just two performances that just eke slightly above it for me these days. Moonraker and Octopussy. Moonraker, I think, takes what he does in Spy and turns it up to 11. There is no smoother Bond than Roger in Moonraker. He is just so full of wit, charm, and a sprightly energy that I, I, I just find infectious, similar to Brosnan in Tomorrow Never Dies. More in Moonraker makes you just want to be Bond. He just looks like he's having an absolute blast in that film. 
Octopussy, on the other hand, I think gives him great opportunity to showcase a more dramatic side, and I think he should be commended forever for being able to wear that clown costume and still convey drama and suspense. I mean, it's really quite something. Roger is just a joy to watch in that film. He is often completely underrated for his dramatic work, but whenever he's asked to do such work in moments on Bond, he always absolutely nails it. This is a difficult one for me to choose between, and I'm fully aware that I might be letting my personal bias for the film overall switch me here, but I'm gonna have to go with Moonraker for my peak more performance. I just can't get enough of him in that film. He is so comfortable, so cool, so effortless, peak more in my mind. So next through the chronology is obviously George Lazenby, but he was only in one film, so uh, it, this totally doesn't work with him unless we go down to the minutes of his respective film, in which case I guess he peaks at around one hour, two minutes into the film. Is anything the matter, Sir just a slight stiffness coming on. And so we come to the main man himself, Sean Connery, the actor who I suppose the majority would cite as just being peak Bond in general, but when it comes to his individual films, Goldfinger, his third, is often cited as his best performance, and I'm probably inclined to agree with that. Brilliant. Goldfinger is template Bond in many ways, and just like Roger in Moonraker, something about Sean in Goldfinger is just so joyous and infectious and fun and effortless. It helps that the film features a bunch of iconography that makes it so inseparable from the image of Connery as Bond in general. If there are a couple of other performances that I think have a chance of usurping Goldfinger in Connery's filmography though, it's From Russia With Love and Thunderball. I think Connery's performance in From Russia With Love is quite different from Goldfinger. I'm not sure if more serious is quite the right phrase for it, but there's something less breezy about his performance in that second film, and that could be attributed to sophomore nerves or the fact that, you know, they were trying to make a more down-to-earth spy thriller with From Russia With Love. Uh, but I'm not citing that as a bad thing, necessarily. If that's more your speed than the outlandish fantasy of Goldfinger, then From Russia With Love Connery could well be peak Bond for you. I mentioned Thunderball 2 in the sense that, uh, much like you know, Spy Who Loved Me to Moonraker, I can see why people might say a similar thing, like what I said about Roger about Connery. I mean, the third film was when he really hit his stride, but the fourth film takes that to an even greater level, and indeed, I think that Connery's performance in Thunderball carries over an awful lot of strengths from both Goldfinger and from Russia With Love. That being said, though, I still plant my flag on Goldfinger as the perfect example of peak Connery as Bond. There is just the right level of magic to him, in that role, in that film, that I just can't deny being completely mesmerized by every time I see the film. So, hey, I guess the third film rule works for at least one of the Bonds for me. Do let me know your own peak Bond performance selections in the comments section below. And also below, you can click the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button to stay super up to date on future video uploads. There are a variety of links to my various social media pages below, so please do follow me on those. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.